Hello and welcome again to the Atlanta Radio Theatre Company's podcast, your monthly source for the best in free original audio drama. ARTC is just about to wrap up its 25th anniversary celebration, and we want to thank all of you for your support. Stay tuned as we forge on into next year with exciting new developments in podcasting and audio drama. This month, we bring you a treat for the season of chills and scares, direct from our live performance at Dragon Con, The Call of Cthulhu, written by H.P. Lovecraft and adapted for audio by Ron N. Butler, presented in two parts. Our next live show will be at the Academy Theater in Avondale Estates on October 24th and 25th, where we will present The Call of Cthulhu. Experience the horror in the way that only the excitement of live theater can provide. If you're enjoying these podcasts, please remember that ARTC is supported by people like you through the sale of our studio productions. Order by mail through ARTC.org, download at audible.com or iTunes, and also look for us on Amazon. You can also now show your support of quality, original audio drama to the world with our expanded merchandise line available through CafePress.com slash ARTC. And now, part one of The Call of Cthulhu. island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity. But someday the piecing together of disjointed bits of information and knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and reveal to mankind how frightful is our position therein. And we shall either go mad or flee into the blessed oblivion of a new dark age. The Atlanta Radio Theatre Company presents The Call of Cthulhu by H.P. Lovecraft. Audio adaptation by Ron N. Butler. From the private files of George Gamel Angel, Professor Emeritus of Semitic Languages at Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island. A carbon copy of a letter to his nephew, Francis Thurston, Professor of Archaeology at Miskatonic University dated May 15, 1925. My dear nephew, I'm having my lawyer, Baker, send copies of this letter to seaports from Yokohama to Christchurch, hoping to catch you before you return from your latest archeological expedition in those parts. I would not attempt to contact you in such a desperate fashion had not events both strange and sinister disturbed me here in Providence. But I have been disturbed, no frightened by certain occurrences, not just here, but all around our world, and they seem to focus on the broad stretch of the Pacific where you are, or where I hope you still are. I find I cannot come directly to business without sounding either senile or demented. I have to lay out some groundwork. Fortunately, I can begin by referring to an object you are sure to remember the grotesque stone idol you found, for you are an incorrigible snoop, as all we archaeologists are, on a top shelf in the back of my office. You were only a lad, but you'll remember it well. Good lord, uncle, what, what is that thing? It's the ugliest doorstop I've ever seen. Put that back where you found it, and quit pawing through my office. Between 11 and 12 inches in height, a monster a vaguely anthropoid outline. The face is a mass of squid-like tentacles, a scaly, bloated body, prodigious claws on hind and forefeet, and long, narrow wings behind. The thing squats on a rectangular pedestal covered with indecipherable characters. It was carved from a soapy, greenish-black stone with golden flecks and striations, like nothing familiar to geology. It came into my possession in 1908, the American Archaeological Society's convention was held in New Orleans that year. I delivered a paper on Maltese cult sites of the megalithic era, and then went on to an early dinner with my old colleague, Professor William Channing Webb, 
a philologist and explorer of no slight note. In his younger years, of course. We had reached the convivial stage of coffee and cigars when a tall man in a cheap suit strode up to us with a bundle in his hands and without so much as a by your leave demanded. Is either of you Professor Webb? Now see here. Uh, calm yourself, George. I am Webb and you are Inspector... Uh... Webb had noted, as I had not, that the fellow had a gold policeman's badge pinned to his lapel. A curious design. A star within a crescent. I'm Inspector Jean Legrasse of the New Orleans Police. I've been looking for you half of the afternoon, Professor. Everyone here, I ask my question and they say, Find Webb, he will know if anyone does. I am flattered, Inspector, but a uh, uh, question about what? I... About the deeds. He placed the bundle on the table between our coffee cups and pulled back the burlap covering it, revealing the double of the statue in my office, but only two inches high. Webb picked up the grotesque charm and turned it over and over in his hands while I remonstrated with our rude visitor. Look, Inspector, uh, whoever you are, this is obviously some crude Caribbean voodoo idol, and both Professor Webb and I are specialists yes, in... Yes, yes, I, I have seen something very like this. In fact, exactly like this, I... Excellent! Your colleagues were correct. Find Webb. Good Lord, William, where? High up on the West Greenland coast, 40 years ago, there was a tribe of degenerate Eskimos there who practiced a form of devil worship, something bloodthirsty and, and repulsive. Their, their idol was a thing like this, except carved out of sandstone. They, they, they practiced obscene rites before it, including human sacrifice, as the, the other tribes told us, worshipping a supreme elder devil, this creature. I took a, a phonetic copy of the chant from their anger cock, the, the wizard priest. How did it go up? Uh, a thing, Louis, Muggle Wanoff, Cthulhu, Rilia Waganagle, Athan. And he and Lagrasse finished the incantation together. Where has that chant been heard, Inspector? In the swamps to the south of this city. There are many practitioners of Voodoo called there, but this is not Voodoo. This is something worse. And older, and more evil, and native to neither Louisiana nor Greenland. That is why you came looking for me? For men of science, and one of spirit, I hope. The chant has been heard across the swamps for the past nine days. It is driving the swamp dwellers mad with fear. That, and there have been raids. A dozen men and women carried off. This stone was found in the ashes of a burnt-out house. Very interesting, Inspector, but what are you expecting the American Archaeological Society to do about it? I will be leading a raid into the swamp this evening. I had hoped to bring along a man with knowledge of these monstrosities for his wisdom and guidance. Professor Webb, will you help us? All these years, I, I, I remember the eyes of the Inuit when they told us about the obscenities this cult practiced in their land. Y yes, Inspector, you need someone to... William, I... you can't go. It's folly. But George, I must. People don't seem to understand nowadays, but to be a man of science means means duty, a duty to the truth, a duty to humanity, and I am after You all are the... 73 years old. Oh. You're hobbling on a gouty foot, and you take a battery of medicines every morning. Oh. You're not up to a nighttime expedition God oh. knows how many miles into the Louisiana swamps. Inspector, I'll go with you. Oh. And you are? Professor George Angel. I'm a specialist in Mediterranean and Middle Eastern cults. And Professor Webb can tell me all he knows of this monstrosity far more quickly than he could brief you. Are you sure, George? It, it, it might be the best out of that. I, I don't think I'm quite up to it. I, but it might be for the best at that. Professor uh, Angel, are you sure you are fit for this expedition? <laughs> Young man, two years ago I was clambering up the face of the Great Pyramid at Giza on Midsummer's Night. I'm up to a little waiting. Bien, Professor. I will meet you in the lobby of the Monteleon in one hour. I should not have lied to Lagrasse. I had indeed surveyed the Great Pyramid in 1889. Just getting to the scene of the action that might that night exhausted me physically. And what we found there... 
two horse-drawn buggies and an automobile carried Inspector LaGrasse, 20 policemen, and me, south into the desolate back country until the roads ran out. That took us to the largest of the squatter villages, whose headman had come to the New Orleans police begging for help. That same headman led us to the swamp beyond, and through smaller clusters of decaying shacks in which terrified people huddled. But where the true swamp began, where we must wade because there was no solid ground, even he refused to go any further. And when a blood-curdling shriek <coughs> cut through the gathering night, that where they ran away too, the grass and his men, and I, were left to make our way unguided into the darkness, drawn on by the chanting, the drums, and the howls of the damned. After what seemed like hours, or ages, we spotted a cluster of lights ahead of us and approached more cautiously. Here, we all knew, was the evil we had come seeking to destroy. Before us was a grassy island of perhaps an acre's extent, in the center of which stood a granite pillar, eight feet in height and ringed with bonfires, and on top of which squatted a larger twin to the noxious amulet resting in Lagrasse's pocket. A dozen white poles stood around the edges of the clearing, each hung with a long scarlet banner. In the face between the poles and the ring, a fire, a horde of human abnormality, devoid of clothing, were braying, bellowing, and writhing, swaying from left to right in worship of the monstrosity at its center. Lagrasse produced a small telescope. Regard the idol atop the pillar, Professor Angel. It is the same as the small one. I'm not surprised, Inspector Lagrasse. Could, could I borrow your spyglass? Of course. Betono, Baldwin, each of you take six men and circle around. You to the left and you to the right. And when you are in position, we will rush them. You may wish to make more haste, Inspector. If you'll look through your spyglass, sir, you'll see that those are not flags hanging from those poles. They are the flayed bodies of men and women. And I think some of them may still be alive. Webb, you will recall, did say they practiced human sacrifice. My God! You have two minutes! Now move! Alas for planning, the grass's men did not get those two minutes. Some constable, more excitable or more squeamish than the others, fired his pistol. The scene disintegrated into chaos and combat. When it was over, Lagrasse counted 47 prisoners, whom he forced to dress. Five cultists lay dead, two seven severely wounded ones were carried away on improvised stretchers. The image on the monolith was confiscated by Lagrasse. Of the dozen kidnapped and flayed victims, none survived, thanks be to God. Only two of the prisoners were found sane enough to be hanged. The rest were committed to various institutions. All denied any part in the ritual murders. What the police did learn came mainly from an immensely old woman the cultists called Mother Castro. Before I left New Orleans, Lagrasse summoned me to the asylum where the old woman was being held. Last name, Castro. First name, unknown. Age, unknown. But she cannot be younger than 70. Country of origin, unknown. But she talks readily enough. Something wrong with her head, I think. Talks too much for her own safety, so I had her placed in here, away from the others. And what she says be trusted? Professor, she is in an insane asylum. She was arrested, naked, at a scene of human sacrifice. Which she blames on, let me see... The black-winged ones who come from their dwelling place in the deepest swamp. What do you think? Nonetheless, I would like to hear what she has to recount. I felt sure you would. Long, long before there were men, the great old ones came to the young world out of the sky. They were not made of flesh and blood, or the stuff of our world. When the stars are right, they can plunge from world to world. But when the stars are wrong, they cannot live. 
But although they no longer live, they never truly die. They lie in stone houses in their great city of Rilia under the waters, preserved by the spells of mighty Cthulhu, to rise again when the stars and the earth once more are ready for them. And you, your people, they watch over the great old ones. The old ones told their secrets and dreams to the first men, and the first men formed the cult. It has always existed, and always will exist, hidden in distant wastes and dark places across the world until the time when great Cthulhu from his house of stones in Rilia shall rise and rule the earth again. Someday he will call when the stars are ready and we will be waiting to free him. So this great Cthulhu cannot free himself? Some force from outside must arouse them. They lie wakeful in the dark as the uncounted years roll by. They know all that occurs in the universe. Even now they talk in their tombs. That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons even death may die. Tell me, Castro, what does this mean? Feng Lui, no, Muggle Wanak no, no. Fatulu. You must not Rilia. speak that. No, it is forbidden What does it to you? mean, Castro? In his house, at Rilia, Dead Cthulhu lies dreaming. And where is this really a Castro? No, no, I cannot tell you. I may not speak of it. To speak of him is death. And when will he awaken, Castro? Do not when? ask me. Do you know? Do not ask. Even to be asked is... is uh, 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 uh! Orderly, call a doctor. This patient is dead. I left New Orleans the following day. Mother Castro was buried in a pauper's grave. The grass gave me the carving, the idol of Cthulhu from atop the pillar, as a keepsake, or as a reward for accompanying him on the raid, or maybe just to get the damnable thing out of his city. When I got back to Providence, I put it on a back shelf in my office and tried not to think about it. I succeeded, too, until a few weeks ago. I was grading papers in my office on the 2nd of March when... Hello? Hello? Professor Angel? <laughs> what, 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 who's there? Who's there? It's not office hours. That's all right. I don't have an appointment. Who, who are you? Are you one of my students? <laughs> no. Are you sure? I swear I've seen you in Survey of Egyptology. I'm not a student here. I go to the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, then you want the arts department. That's over on... No, 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 no. I'm looking for an... Archaeologist, possibly a philologist, a man wise in strange tongues and writings and dreams older than brooding Tyre, or the contemplative Sphinx or garden-girdled Babylon. I was on the point of throwing him out. He was certainly disreputable looking enough, self-consciously artistic in his mannerisms, sloppy in his dress and long hair, standing in my doorway with a cardboard box clutched to his narrow chest. But... Something in the phrasing of his last sentence caught my attention. Very well, yes, I am Professor Angel, Semitic Languages Emeritus. What does that last word mean? It means I have an office and teach whatever I care to, whenever I care to, if I care to. And you are? Henry Wilcox, artiste of the decadent and the macabre. Pardon me if I don't shake hands, it's bourgeois. Ah, you also have your hands full and are standing a good ten feet away from me. Oh, good grief. Come in and sit down. Thank you. Now, what can I do for you, Mr. Wilcox? Is it something to do with that box? Yes, it's to do with hieroglyphs. A broad field. Egyptian hieroglyphs? Mesopotamian cuneiform? Easter Island Rongo Rongo? <laughs> no, no, no. None of those. Did you feel the earthquake last night? I can't say I did, but there's a trolley line running down my street. I did. It excited me. <laughs> when I finally went to bed, I had dreams, unprecedented dreams, of cyclopean cities of titan blocks and sky-flung monoliths all dripping with green ooze and sinister with horror. And from deep below the ground, a voice, like a great bell, cried, Cthulhu Thad, Cthulhu Thad. I could not draw a breath. 
I had not thought of Inspector Legrasse or Mother Castro for years, but, but I heard the obscene chanting of the cultists and saw the flayed bodies of their victims as if they were before me, not this inconsequential young man. And, and that's it. You had these dreams, and then you went back to sleep. Oh, no. I woke at dawn, sitting at my sculpting table in my nightshirt. I must have worked all night on it. Worked on what? This. He reached into the cardboard box and lifted out a clay sculpture, still slightly damp, and deposited it heavily upon the top of my desk. It took all my will not to look behind me to see if Legrasse's stone fetish had not come to life and climbed down from my dusty shelves. For this was Cthulhu. Ape's body, bat's wings, dragon's claws, tentacled visage, in clay instead of stone. And not squatting, but climbing out of a stone slab coffin, reaching for... for the stars? The moon? Dominion over the earth? I stared at the thing in perfect horror. See, the hieroglyphs I wanted to ask about are incised on the sides of the sepulcher. What? Oh, oh no, no, I'm, I'm afraid they're like nothing I've ever seen. Oh, what a disappointment. Well, I needn't take up any more of your time. No, no, Mr. Uh, Wilcox, the figure you've sculpted here, is that a, a frequent subject for you? Oh, goodness, no. It's striking, powerful, demonic even, but... I had never imagined such a thing before. It was in my dream, too. Really? You're sure? I am an expert on the subterranean cults of the megalithic age in the Mediterranean. I know some of the symbolism has been picked up by, well, by popular culture, even by cults. Cults? How stimulating. And I know that cult activity has a certain attraction to the uh, artistic mind. And how, let me tell you, some of my friends are pretty weird. So if you were a uh, devotee of such a group, I would hold that fact in strictest confidence. <laughs> if you... no, sorry, Professor Angel. None of that cult stuff for me. I'm an orthodox theosophist. I see. Uh, Mr. Wilcox, let me ask you a favor. If you have any more of these striking dreams, would you come by my office or my, or my house the next morning and tell me about them? You can count on it. Well, I'd uh, better be going. Oh, uh, better take my sculpture with me. Please, please do, Mr. Wilcox. He was as good as his word, and voluminous in his imaginings. If they were imaginings, and not visions, terrifying visions. He came to my office the next morning, and the next, and the next, and the... It was all I could do to keep up with him as his dreams poured from him. Professor, the most astounding images last night. Shall I begin? Uh, yes, of course. Let me, let me get a pencil. It seemed to me in my dream that I skimmed across the glassy surface of a great sea under a livid sky of writhing, blood-streaked clouds. This I Wilcox turned out to be the grandson of an old friend of mine, Colonel Alan Wilcox. This grandson was a precocious youth, but also a young man of great... Uh, Eccentricity. He had from childhood regaled family and strangers alike with strange stories and accounts of his dreams. He called himself psychically hypersensitive. Acquaintances whom I interviewed called him, well, a number of things, mostly vulgar. And called imperiously for mankind to arise, arise on a pilgrimage of liberation and restoration, of destruction and doom, of rending and eating. Wilcox had been studying sculpture at the Rhode Island School of Design and living alone at the Fleur de Lis building near that institution. His hours and habits were irregular, his acquaintances disreputable and dubious, but there were no hints of the fraudulent or criminal, I been in my body, or I would have occult, in his background. Whatever the source of his visions, whether he was originator or conduit, they seemed to me to be genuine the colossal statues and, and terrifying. And that showed the creature I sculpted from clay in the dawn after that first night of revelations. Nor but was Wilcox the only inhabitant of Providence to be dreaming strange West. dreams that March. Oh, average people in society and business then seemed no different. I was in my body. But the I university's aesthetes, poets, the artists, seemed drawn and worn, sliding, given to whispered conversations and downcast and eyes. And there were riots in both Federal Hill and Mount Hope, riots the police could not put down before dawn, and the 
only to break out afresh the next, the next night. I could see the smoke of burning buildings and warehouses from my office window on several mornings. The gaping mouth of the god tomb was black with a darkness that burst forth like smoke from its eon-long imprisonment, darkening the sun. The newspapers, national and foreign, headlined the usual events. A tornado that swept across three states in the Midwest, an earthquake in Yunnan, a naval base to be built on the island of Singapore. But there were also reports hinting at a psychic disturbance among the sensitive worldwide. A nocturnal suicide in London, where a lone sleeper leapt from his fifth floor window with a ululating shriek. Insurrection in India involving right adherents of all the subcontinent's religions Bang. in their millions. Mughal Wanath. Murders of the most grisly and sensitive sort. On the morning of the 23rd, Wilcox did not appear. At lunchtime, I sought out his lodgings where one of his fellow artists told me. No, he's not here. He shouted and ranted all night until we wrapped him in wet blankets. His family collected him this morning in an ambulance. So, presuming on my acquaintance with his grandfather, I made my way to the family's home on Waterman Street. Oh, thank heavens you've come, Doctor. Uh, you're not Dr. L.B. No, madam, I'm Professor Angel. His associate, of course. Please come this way, Dr. Angel. That's why my, my husband isn't with you. He's following with Dr. L.B. I really couldn't say. Dr. L.B. isn't coming? Well, you best examine my son yourself. Well? I followed her into the house, barely able to keep up with her in sight as she strode ahead. We made him comfortable in the sitting room until his bedroom can be cleaned out and aired. Mrs. Wilcox, I'm afraid you're laboring under a slight misapprehension about me. You're not a doctor. Well, I, I have a doctorate. It's just that Then I'm... I insist you examine my son, doctor. Henry Wilcox lay before me on a chaise long, swaddled like a papoose, with a hot water bottle squatting on his forehead like a green rubber toad. I'm no physician, but anyone who has bossed a field archaeology expedition can set a bone or recognize malaria. So in a minute, I was able to tell Wilcox's mother. He's not running a fever, so you need not sweat lodge him. His breathing and pulse are a little slow, but not unusual for a sleeping man, which appears to be what he is doing, sleeping. Abigail, I brought Dr. Elby Then in. who is this? Why, it's, it's Professor Angel, isn't it? Father's adjutant and the old second volunteers, weren't you? Yes. Well, if you're not a doctor, um, Dr. L.B., will you please examine Henry now that the charlatan has manhandled him? How is your father, by the way? He's dead these five years. Oh, sorry to hear that. Well, this young man is not running a fever, so I would advise you to take some of these blankets off him. His breathing and pulse are a little slow, but not unusual for a sleeping man. What seems to be the problem with him? My son has always been sensitive and high-strung, neurasthenic. Last night, or so we were told by the ruffians at the house where he has rooms, he became very agitated and had to be agitated. And he had to be restrained. Mr. Wilcox and I brought him home this morning. He was, as you see him now, sleeping. But we cannot wake him. Ah, uh -huh. In that case, I advise you to let him sleep. I'll call him again this afternoon to check on him. In the meantime, I have appointments at my office. Then let me see you out, doctor. Professor, you know Henry? <laughs> he, he, he came to my office at the university a few weeks back to ask about some hieroglyphics he had seen on a piece of sculpture. Wasn't able to help him much, I'm afraid. Uh, I see. He's uh, an unusual young man. Uh, he takes after his mother. I see. Look, Wilcox, your good wife seems about done in by the strain of the uh, situation. You don't know the half of it. And frankly, you look a bit worn down yourself. Henry's likely to sleep the day away. Why don't I, why don't I sit in that armchair over there and keep an eye on him while you and uh, Abigail, uh, Abigail, recuperate, get him, get him, get his room ready, that sort of thing. Uh, w would you? That is how I came to spend ten days off and on at the bedside of Henry Wilcox. I kept my vigil half out of an obscure guilt. 